Hell no. John Fink. Are we still live? Bill 68 till I die. Get I'm sorry, man. I blacked out. Randolph children. DJ Khaled, you know a big DJ Khaled guy? Hands grow up and in. Goodman needs to be fired all the time. Josh Pastor. You're going to beat people straight up. You know the deal. They have no swag. They have no nothing. Terrell McNeil. From the bluest of the blue bloods to the smallest of the mid majors. This is Field of 68. After dark. Hello and welcome to the Friday evening edition of the Field of 68 After Dark. It is day two of the NCAA tournament. We are live here in Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas. We're live Sirius XM Channel 84. We're streaming over on the stadium app and we are live on our YouTube channel. Jump in the chat. Make sure you ask us some questions. I have Jeff Goodman with me. I have John Henson with me. I have Terrence Oglesby with me. My name is Rob Doster. We have a lot to cover tonight, guys. We got to talk about that thriller Florida, Colorado. We got to talk about an unbelievable upset between Auburn and Yale. We caught up with the man of the hour, John Pulikidis, the star of uh, of Yale's upset. He had 28 points. We found out boy. where he gets his haircut every single game. Um, and we got to talk about what's going on with this Grand Canyon ending. But where we have to start, guys, is James Madison. The Dukes knocked off Wisconsin in a game, T.O., that didn't feel... It felt like the 12 seed yeah. was the better team. It yeah. felt like the 12 seed was the 5 seed. Jim, you won 72 to 61. What do you make of the Dukes? What do you make of this win? If they're this good every game, they might be Final Four good. I think that's the scariest thing about this JMU team. Uh, the Dukes play Duke next round. They could beat Duke yeah. because of their ability to create cause problems, create turnovers. 28 points today off turnovers against Wisconsin, who doesn't typically turn the ball over. If you're able to do that against Wisconsin, sure, they probably had their worst game of the year handling the Rock. That all being said, you still have to do it. And for them to be able to create those opportunities for themselves, get out and transition and score on a night, quite frankly, guys, where the Dukes didn't really shoot the ball all that well either. They dominated this game. Yeah, um, wire to wire. Yep. It, it never looked like Wisconsin had a chance. The body language was... It looked like they were defeated early. Uh, Chucky Hepburn kind of was head down. Um, that James, it definitely looked like they were underseated. I think yep. they should probably be a higher seed. Unfortunately, Wisconsin had to run into them in the first round. Next round with Duke, I, I, I'm, I think they can get them. I think they can, I think they can get them because because they play hard, they're physical, they can score the ball. They're older. They're older. So that's the formula. It seems like for this tournament. Yep. You know, was this more of an 8-9 game, though, to me? Are we overrating James Madison because they beat a Wisconsin team that, frankly, hasn't been very good in six weeks? That's my only question. I don't know. I want to see it. James Madison, last I checked, they didn't win their own league regular season. They were swept by App State. So I'm not ready. They were great defensively against the Wisconsin team that, frankly, was great for the first month of the season and then was mediocre after that. Yeah, well, here's here's the only thing that I'll say about that is I don't think that James Madison necessarily played great. Like, a lot of times when you see mid-major programs upset one of the big boys, it's because they go nuts from three. Yeah. Or because you have a guy like um, – like Jake, uh, Jake, Go um, why am I blanking on this last night? Jake from Oakland went for hit ten goalkeeper, hit 10 threes last night, right? Yeah, you have a guy having an outlier performance. James Madison was five for 17 from three, they didn't have yeah, anyone score more than 14 well. points. That was defense, they forced 19 turnovers. They were awesome defense, they were the bigger, tougher, more physical, defensive minded team. They big boyed a big 10 team tonight. That's why that's what stood out to me more than anything else. And I hear you, you're right, but I will just say this. They are now one win away. They have to get one more Big Ten team. I don't know if they can do it, but if they beat one more Big Ten team, they have the same number of wins in the Big Ten this year as Michigan. Yeah, I mean, again, all, all I'm saying is – I just wanted to is, take a shot at Michigan. That's all yeah, that that's was. That's not nice. I mean, they don't, they don't deserve a stray like that. The Juwan was just far, fired. What, what are we giving them a stray for? <laughs> uncalled it, yeah. for. Absolutely uncalled for. You settle down. Finish your point, though. Go ahead. You know, my, my point is just, again, let's see what they do against Duke, who hasn't been great this year, right? They've been kind of up and down. 
if if they beat Duke, I'm ready to say, okay, they're for real, and then they're a Final Four contender. So I'm that's, not. That's I'm all not it's going to take. That's all it's going to take, guys. They're, they're talking about the, the hockey game over here. No, no it's, a, it's, it's a it's a hell of a win. They've had an unbelievable season. I'm just saying they beat a Wisconsin team that. Honestly, if they didn't do what they did in the first month, they wouldn't have been in the tournament. Can someone back me up here? James Madison is now 32 and 3. They have the most teams wins of any team in college basketball. Yeah, here's someone the, back me up. They yeah, won at the Breslin Center. I like they them. They beat Michigan State. I like them a lot. I think we're the here, prisoner here's, of here's the here's moment. The, we are the prisoner of the moment sometimes. And I think right now, let's see. Here's here's what I'll say about that. To me, that doesn't say anything about about with the overrating James Madison. Maybe we should look at the fact that there's a team in James Madison's league that swept them, that won the league regular season title, that beat Auburn at home this year in App State. Maybe we need to give more credit to the little guys when they do the things that impress us like this. It's the same team that just got beat by Wake Forest in the NIT. Yeah. That swept them. NIT doesn't count. Just, just, well, that's what I'm saying. I'm just throwing that out there. But ha- I... I, I I'm not necessarily worried about that, but the fact that they were able to do what they did today defensively, that offense is going to catch up. They don't have bad shooters on that team. Uh, I I think I was most impressed with their physicality, how strong they were. Uh, How they swarmed to the ball was really impressive against Wisconsin, who as methodical as they are within their offense, they were able to speed them up. Now, they're going up against a Duke team that we've talked about that you guys – Rob, Jeff, have called soft. They yes. better not be soft against JMU. They're going to get beat. Yes. So I, I think that's an intriguing matchup coming up. Uh, those freshmen, McCain, some of those guys, they're going to have to play really well against JMU because those are grown men on that team. And, and I think that's been a common theme for this whole tournament. These teams that are winning, upsetting, they just come out and they're bigger, faster, stronger. I don't know if it's you don't see it on film or you're not ready until you see it in person. That could kind of be overwhelming for teams. I mean, you look at this Grand Canyon game, you watch it. I mean, every time I look up, they're dunking it, laying it up. So sometimes when a team just jumps on you, it's nothing you can do. And that's, I think Wisconsin, they fell victim to that, and they never let up. All right, let's there, there, there is some credence to, to Wisconsin not being good the back yes. half of the year, but it's also the same Wisconsin team that beat Purdue to get to the Big Ten championship yeah. game. So, <laughs> like – they they just people do a week ago. Yeah, they're they're a, they're a good team. I, I just but there's now you know what to be Jeff said Jeff about like when something gets on top of you, they're going. They're not them. overwhelming. That's, that's right. That's what I'm trying to say. Wisconsin is not an overwhelming right. team. When you looked at James Madison and you look at Wisconsin, you honestly might say JMU looks like the high major team. Yeah, that's that's not wrong. Yale doesn't look like a high major team. No, they do not. John Pulikita doesn't look like a high major player. But you know what they did, John Henson. They came back from 10 points down in the second half to beat Auburn tonight. And uh, I think that was probably, to me, that was the most entertaining game that we've seen so far. Maybe it wasn't the best, but I just think that when you have the little guy making it, you don't see that often, right? I think I think it was a bad game plan. I'm watching the game. You saw Bruce Pearl talk about we just want to speed them up. That didn't work. They're bigger, faster, stronger than Yale. Stay in front, be solid, make them take a tough shot. They were fouling to they were in a bonus with 14 minutes left in the second half. Right. That's not how you that's not how you win. That's how you get upset. And I think that game plan of just being over aggressive, even pushing the ball, a couple of crucial turnovers. They just had to stay solid to beat Yale and they let them creep back in, creep back in. End it, of the it, game, here you go. Style makes the fight. Right. And we said it and said it and said it again, but with Yale, they're not gonna just willingly turn the ball over. Now they had eight in the first half or nine in the first half. But outside of that, when it when push came to shove, the last ten minutes of the game, Yale took care of the ball. And, and what ends up happening is they had to hit some tough shots, but because that confidence was going, those shots start to fall a lot easier. And guys, I'm going to be honest with you, Derek Wolf. I haven't seen a whole whole lot of him this year. I apologize. I didn't know about your game because that dude can go. He wasn't great statistically today. I think he was four or fifteen from the field, but like ability to put it on the deck, step outside and shoot it. My God, he that constantly guy is really put, good. He constantly put pressure on, even though he didn't shoot it well. Yeah. He put pressure on Auburn every possession, whether he was driving, passing, attacking. So he was a, he was very effective, even though he didn't, the stats don't show it. Yeah. 
Um, you mentioned that they hit tough shots. We were able to catch up with a guy that hit all of those tough shots, Jake Poulakitis, 10 for 15 from the floor, a very nice 6 and 9 from three, and he hit the dagger, the go-ahead three, to put, the, to put Yale up 73-72 with two minutes left. I looked at the crowd and said, oh, my God, which was exactly our reaction. Let's get into an interview with the man they call Johnny P now. And now let me welcome onto the field of 68 after dark, John Hulakitis, fresh off of scoring 28 points in a win for number 13 Yale as they upset number four seed Auburn. John, uh, I got to imagine that after you do that on national television, it, uh, it, it, it might make your phone melt down quite a little bit. How many texts have you gotten so far this afternoon? Probably, probably a little over 200. Um, yeah, my, you know, my phone's definitely blown up. <laughs> Something I've never experienced like this before. Um, yeah, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> Take me through the uh, some of the moments at the end. There was one shot you hit, the step back that put Yale ahead, that put you guys up. Uh, 73 to 72 and ended up being the game winning basket the cameras caught it. i don't know if you've seen the the highlights but i think you said something like oh my god to the crowd I, were you surprised that you were making some of the shots that you were taking um i know i definitely wouldn't say i was surprised um it was just, it was just a great feeling i had sort of i sort of just blacked out in that moment <laughs> um I was, I was locking eyes with my parents almost the entire game uh, and, and in that moment, it was the same situation. I was just looking at my mom and was sort of saw, seeing the crowd go wild. Um, and I sort of just blacked out. <laughs> when did you realize that you you had it? When did you realize that you were shooting this well when you were going to have a game like this? Um, honestly, yeah, after I hit my first couple of shots, uh, you know, the, the basket definitely starts looking bigger, uh, as probably with any shooter, with any score, that's the same uh, same case. But you know, after I hit those first couple, my confidence definitely started to rise. And obviously, you know, we kept it close throughout the first half. We knew that we were going to be able to get the job done if we just stayed composed uh, through all of their runs, uh, which we did. Um, and I'm just very proud of everybody. When you guys got down by 10, I think it was midway through the second half, it felt like it was kind of turning towards Auburn, right? The, the tides were turning. It's, it's not often when you see some of these underdogs, some of these Cinderella's like you guys find a way to be able to come back from a deficit like that. What were those huddles like? What was those those team moments like? How did you guys find a way to, to dig deep and make that run? Yeah, um, I think that was a key point for us to win the game uh, as far as what Coach Jones had stressed to us in scout was that we had to stay composed and stay together through their runs. We knew that they're a great team on both ends of the ball and that to, to get the job done, that we were going to have to stay calm, cool, and collected um, throughout the course of the game, all the ebbs and flows. Uh, and, and then during that stretch, the main message was just, you know, that we've been here before, um, you know, take you back to a week ago when we were down six mm -hmm. with 30 seconds left and an insane comeback to put us in this position um, to be in March Madness. I mean, the resiliency that we've showed the last couple of weeks, um, just to reiterate, I'm just so proud of everybody in our locker room. Um, and to answer your question, you know, the, the conversations were mainly just about staying focused and staying together. Johnny P, Henson. Johnny P, again, this is another situation where when we talk about a lot of these upsets, it's because the dude goes absolutely nuts. He had his, his career high. I don't know how many times he's hitting some of those step backs mm -hmm. in, uh, in in a lot of games. And I'll tell you this, Yale seems like they always play fun basketball games. The Ivy title game was just as crazy as this. So uh, what what do you make of Yale's chances to get to the Sweet 16 they got San Diego State next? Um, I love San Diego State. I think San Diego State's going to play more of a style that Yale's going to really have to beat them. Auburn just too many mistakes, mental mistakes. I don't think San Diego State's going to do that. Um, so we tough to beat them. Yeah, uh, di yeah. different matchup defensively. Yeah. San Diego State's going to be more positioning, stay in mm -hmm. front, and then be physical. Auburn's going to be out in the passing lanes, try to create havoc. Very different in the way they approach it. Uh, let, let's be honest, though. It, it still comes down to shot making and individual creation. Yeah. Pulikaitis, if he's able to do some of those same things, he's a dangerous guy. Mm -hmm. T.O., I'm going to give you 45 seconds here. All right. You had a little bit of a rivalry with a certain fan base. Yeah. Would you like to address anything to the camera? I just hate that you had to take an L in such glorious fashion, Auburn <laughs> fans. That's just what happens when you come at me with such ferocity. And here I am.
collecting W's. I'm not going to eat the W's like James Swiss is. I'm just going to show it to you. That's what I'm doing. Uh, hey, in all seriousness, happy uh, Bruce Pearl, Steve Pearl. Love those guys. I love this Auburn team. Uh, tough loss uh, for them. It's just style makes the fight. They've been good all year, but I think this Yale team was exactly what they didn't need to go against. Shout out to the real Tigers. The, yeah, the real Tigers. <laughs> hey, you, know, yeah. you know what we haven't mentioned about Auburn? They were without Chad Baker Mazzara for the entire game. Yeah. yeah. If he doesn't get kicked out of that game for that elbow. Do you think you got 10 seconds? Do you think that it was deserved? Should he have gotten yeah, the play it was two? completely deserved, and it changed the whole game. It did. Yeah, I agree. Listen, when we come back, we got to talk about the SEC big picture, fellas. We hyped them up. They have not performed. That's not. The best month of the year is here, which is why you need to know that we are now partnered with BetMGM. We'll be using BetMGM lines to make all of our picks, and we'll have special offers for the listeners and the viewers of the Field of 68 all through the NCAA tournament. If you haven't signed up for BetMGM yet, you can use the bonus code FIELD and you will get up to a $1,500 first bet offer on your first wager with BetMGM, regardless of whether or not that bet hits. Here's the best part. All you need to do is deposit and bet $10 of your hard-earned money. This is how you make it work. Download the BetMGM app and sign up using the bonus code FIELD. Deposit at least $10 and place your first wager on any game, and you get up to $1,500 in bonus bets, regardless of the outcome of your bet. Just make sure you use that bonus code FIELD when you sign up. Most importantly, we do have some fun stuff coming for the conference tournaments and especially for the NCAA tournament. Bet insurance tokens, college hoops, odds boosts, and... What I love the most, a nice parlay boost for anything you could possibly imagine betting on in the NCAA tournament, from odds and getting an at-large bid to Final Four futures to the highest seed to make to the Sweet 16. I'm calling it right now. BetMGM is the king of the prop bet for your March Madness needs. So go download the BetMGM app, use the code FIELD, and sign up today. And while I've got you a quick request, the best way to support the field of 68 and our content you get for free is to engage with us. Rate and review the pod. Like and share the YouTube videos. Tell your friends about us. It helps in a world where the algorithm is king. And now, back to the show. Welcome back to the Field of 68 after dark. Friday night after another crazy slate of college basketball games here. Day two of the NCAA tournament. We are live at Mandalay Bay. Jeff Goodman, John Henson, Terrence Oglesby. My name is Rob Doster. We got to talk about the SEC, fellas. We got to talk about it. We got to have a conversation. Alabama looked great today, right? That was a perfect Ten matchup for them. Yeah. Tennis Tennessee looked great against a 15 seed. But overall, the league is now 3-5 and five in the tournament. Kentucky bounced. Auburn bounced. South Carolina got run out the gym. Mississippi State got run out the gym. Florida, they lost on a buzzer beater. Sure. So a team with three NBA players. It is what it is. But, Jeff, do we, do we have to – how do we view this, right? It's hard in a one-game sample size to to get a real sense for how good a league is. But also, two of the, the two best teams in the league might have just lost to mid-major programs and got upset. Tennessee's the best team in the league. We knew that most of the year, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I think we knew they were the team, if you were going to bet your house on one team, it was going to be the Tennessee Volunteers. Yep. You trusted them the most once you got a chance to really watch Dalton connect, right? Kentucky, you knew they could do this. Maybe not to Oakland, but you knew they could lose to anybody or beat anybody. Auburn, a little bit overrated. A little bit overrated. But again, you can't judge a league on the NCAA tournament. We've learned that. Like, it's a one and done deal. Things happen. I think the SEC is better than it showed in the tournament, but no league was dominant this year. Even the Big 12, I don't think, is a dominant, dominant league like a lot of people talked about. We'll see here, again, if they've got teams that can go deep into the tournament. We're one round in. Mm -hmm. I think it's the I think it's a st style of play. I mean, I, I feel like the SEC, run and gun, defend, run around with you, like a chick with your head cut off. And I think in a tournament, you have to adjust your style of play. You have to Players, Auburn shouldn't have played how they played today. Mississippi State tried to out-physical Michigan State. Backfired, mm -hmm. right? Um, Florida, they were down a big man, but, you know, they played a team that had some pros, but definitely a winnable game. These are all teams that we kind of were 
don't have an identity and, and it showed in the tournament. Yeah. The weird thing is, is like, I, it's all matchups in the NCAA yep. tournament. I, I mean, that's what it comes down to. I, I think Jeff makes a good point to where it's, you, you know, it, you can't, it's, it's hard to judge what a league really is off of one game. Uh, however, this is the time where everybody looks at these things. Right. So, like, uh, you need to perform Unfair better. or not. Right. Yeah, unfair, unfair or not, you are judged by uh, what you do. Uh, unfair or not. And, and the odd thing about it is if you look at some of these other leagues, like the Mountain West is catching a lot of shit for the same thing, and yet Utah State just won, and now that league in this tournament's what, three and four? Well, it's three and, and four. So they got two teams with the, the, the play-in. Sec- yeah, they got two teams in the second round, and everybody in the conference was under right? Yeah. That's where – so I, I will push back on anybody that says the Mountain West was a disappointment. No. Boise State got a rough draw getting put in a playing game. Really rough Colorado draw. State didn't deserve to get in a playing game. Then got their ass kicked in the second game on in three days that they had to play, right? Uh, Utah State beat the breaks off the Big 12 team. San Diego State, look, they're in the second round. They advanced. Yeah. They're probably going to be in the Sweet 16 if they can beat Yale. I'm not worried about them. I do want to ask you guys this, though. I feel like Alabama, they, just, they, they blow out Charleston. That's a situation where they our both city. The same, they, bo- they both played the same Yeah, style. I know, but that's what I was going to say. It's like our city kind of played into the way that Alabama wanted to play. I don't think you could beat them at their own game. Right. Texas A&M, though, that's the one that I want to talk about here because yeah. they, we thought they couldn't shoot. We thought that this team was going to be one that would struggle to score. And they showed up today against Nebraska and looked like the damn Showtime Lakers. It was unbelievable. They put up 96 points. At one point, they were 14 for 22 from three. Are they dangerous? Like, where do we stand on them? I I think they just, they did this today. They flexed those muscles. Yep. I I think it was more of an outlier. Wade, Wade Taylor had a great game, obviously. But you watch that game, and Nebraska looked like a, Mid-major team out there, athletically, defensive, offense. Size. I mean, size. Always. It was just, I mean, the, I don't know who it was. He blocked it. I've never seen a three-point shot blocked with two hands. <laughs> I've that. never seen that. So, Poor Jack Hoiberg. Yeah, was, I mean. That was Fred's kid. Yeah. It's, that game was over when it started, man. I think Nebraska got out there, and they were just overwhelmed. Yeah, oh, I, you play two bigs like that. You're going to dominate teams on the glass. But it was. I mean, it was unbelievable how dominant they were. And again, listen, they came in, I think, ranked 346 in the country in three-point shooting yep. percentage. This was kind of a one-off, guys. But they had a great time to do it, right? Like, this is one of those days. And if you hit it like that again, now, now could this be a confidence builder for a and who gets Houston? They're going to need it. Yeah, and what I will say is this. Right. No, nothing that you guys are saying is wrong, but I do feel like in the last four weeks, what's changed with this group is Manny Abaseki has turned into a guy that is a legitimate third option for him. Like this was Wade Taylor. If he's not going, you better hope Boots Radford is going. And if he's got no, go, not going, he got no shot. Now you got a third guy that scored in double figures in eight straight games. He had 22 today. He had 25 in the SEC tournament in one game, scored in double figure in eight straight games. Like, that is a difference. It's now a three-man team, Jeff, instead of just being a two-man team. This Big is difference. Big difference. Because you're right. Before, it was like there were games where it was all on Wade Taylor. Because mm-hmm. yep. Boots Radford wasn't great for a stretch there. You get all three of those dudes going, yeah, you can beat just about anybody. Now, again, it's going to be interesting against Houston because right now a playing big playing physical, playing tough. They've got some dynamic guards. Well, Houston's, what are they? Big, tough, physical, guard, strong. Yeah. The guards are big. Like, hey, Wade Taylor, good luck, because you haven't seen anybody like Jamal Shedd. Hey, bring, bring your lunch pail. And, right, and we've, we've seen a and They beat Iowa State. They beat Tennessee. They beat Kentucky. So we know what they're capable of. Today was – a, a classic showcase of what yeah, they're they, just like this. Yeah. They've been like this. Well, so, well, when, when they shoot the ball well, it changes everything. They yeah. do. And on top of the fact that they had 14 offensive boards and one of the best offensive rebounding teams in the country. So, you, you know, Buzz Williams teams, they're going to guard. They're going to be physical. And golly, are they athletic this year. Like, my God, some of those plays that you were talking about, <laughs> yeah. that two-handed block, I don't care if it was I've coaching. never seen that. I don't care if it's coach's kid or not. Like, that's flat out I've impressive. never seen that. They swarm to the ball so fast. I will tell you this, though. You said that that Jamal uh, uh, Wade Taylor's never seen someone like Jamal Shedd. He has. And you know what he did when he saw him? Put up 34 points. Remember Ooh. when they played this year? 
They played at the Toyota Center in Houston. Right. And that Texas A&M got down by like 18 in the first half. Wade Taylor went bonkers in the second half. Hit uh, six threes, scored 34 points, and took them all the way back and had a shot to tie the game at the end. And he missed it. I'll Houston take my won. chances with Jamal. You're, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. But I, I don't think that that is as much of a gimme. I, I just worry about this was, again, a one-off. And, and, yeah, you're not and wrong. And in two you're days, we're going to see them take those same shots. Yeah. And they're going to do what they did the well, majority so, of the season. Yeah. Got to get right. hot for a weekend. Right. So, right. You, you got hot for a weekend. I mean, John Henson probably had well, his here's, days. Here's a, here's a team that has gotten hot for a weekend. Shoot Colorado. It. KJ Simpson, <laughs> Cody Williams, <laughs> Tristan De Silva. You got three pros on Colorado. They put up 102 points, won an absolute thriller. KJ Simpson hit the game winner at the buzzer uh, to beat Florida. And they now get Marquette. Marquette struggled a little bit with Western Kentucky in the first round. Western Kentucky didn't have the horses, but that is a matchup where it's like, man, that Tyler Kolek. That was a get your yeah. That was a get your feet wet game for Marquette. Like, hey, TK, like, get comfortable. Took a little while. Yeah, get comfortable because it's going to take you about a half. You haven't played in a couple weeks. Like, get comfortable because second game it's going to be a little bit different. Kolek looked like himself though. I yeah. thought that was the biggest thing, right? And, and they, I don't want to say they had to get, like, readjusted to playing with him, but I think the first half was a little bit of that. Yep. I mean, you're not wrong. You have, like, when you when you have someone that as, is as influential to what Marquette wants to do as Tyler Kolek is, and you don't play with him for three weeks, and then you have to bring him back in, like, you change with it. You guys played at a higher level than I did. Correct me if I'm wrong. But when you're missing someone like that, John, and you bring him back in, like, you you have to change what you do without him, and you have to go back to what you do with him, right? Yeah, I? yeah. I mean, it's, it's a rhythm thing. As you're a star player, in a couple of weeks they play without him, practice without him, probably. So they got adjusted and you know outscored them by 20 plus plus points in the second half. So they figured it out fairly quickly that they didn't want to go home. Yeah, and sometimes whenever that guy goes out, everybody hesitates for that half second. You, you have to let yourself go a little bit again, mm -hmm. right, whenever you can rely on Tyler Cullen mm -hmm. completely. I, that obviously changes some things. But uh, it, it took him 15, 20 minutes. Marquette's right back on the wagon. Uh, it's going to be an entertaining game. Give me a prediction of that. Give me a, I, I, I just think that Marquette going up against a team that has some of the length and athleticism that Colorado has won't be the easiest matchup for him. But the flip side – I don't think you could have two more polar opposites in a five-man than Eddie Lampkin and Oso Wigadar. <laughs> like, one guy is big and physical and an absolute bully, and the other guy is big and the, probably the best athlete. I don't is that, not, that might be a crazy thing to say. Eddie Lampkin's not going to be able to do what he did tonight no. in two days. There's no way in hell. I mean, Oso's too long, too athletic. Again, they're different. Have to bury him. They're different. I don't think he'll yeah. bury him. You don't think he can bury Oso? I think he can, but yeah, I don't he, think he will. will. I don't fight think he will. Fight around, push the catch out front. He'll probably front him. He'll probably front him, right? Yeah. Yeah. He should. Would have right? seemed so, but that's yeah. a big man. Eddie Lampkin's a big dude now. I do, oh, we'll see. Before we head to our next break, I do just want to give a shout-out to the end of the Auburn game and the end of the Florida game because the last five minutes of those games happened at the exact same time. The endings were nuts. We got big shots in both of them. We had stressful moments. Me and you got it fired up. I was, that yeah, was I went nuts. That was nuts. That little, like, 10-minute window right there was as good as it gets in college basketball. Those are the moments that we live for. It That's was, why we cover this. It was so stressful that Doster needed three massages to get to the next level. <laughs> he needed three of them. Hey, all I'll say is shout out. Hey, Greg Sankey, I hope you watch Yale, my man. I hope you watch yeah. Yale. Don't get rid of those small guys. Don't get rid of the Cinderella's. Don't screw up the NCAA tournament. That's hey, what I'm, people want to watch, man. Hey, Greg Sankey. If I were him, I'd want more teams in the NCAA tournament too, so that I'd have more chances. Yeah, I mean, like because of course, like he, he, want, he wants Georgia. So well. He probably wants Arkansas, but none of them belong. Yep. I agree. Right? Yeah, I agree. Okay. They shouldn't I'm, I'm, be there. I'm, I'm locked into the St. Mary's Grand Canyon. Yeah. It's well, good game. Henson's got hey, Henson's got like a mill on this game. Yeah, well, listen, no, I got a three leg parlay. I got a three leg, and it's not going to hit. But yeah, we, we're watching the end of Grand Canyon St. Mary's I'm here. Sweating with overtime guys. with five minutes left. Yeah, Grand Canyon is up sixty-one to fifty-five. Hey, hey, I just want a little bit of credit. The chat is giving me credit right now. I tried to tell you about Tyon Grant Foster. You didn't want to listen. I do. You did. 
I wrote a want... story about him earlier this year. Because I tipped I you off. I knew about him. Because I tipped you off. You didn't tip I'm me off. Source. <laughs> I'm Every time Goodman tweets a source told him something, <laughs> oh, yeah. just know just, who the source is. Just know it was I'm not Rob Dostin. Listen, we got to take a break. On the other side, we're going to talk about Northwestern and FAU, and we're also going to get into a little bit of what happened Hey, with the Mountain West teams after the break. By now, you guys have surely heard about Autograph, an app founded by Tom Brady with the intention of disrupting the way that fans consume content covering their favorite teams. This is how the app works. All of the podcasters, bloggers, and digital creators covering a team have their content sent to that team's page in the Autograph app. Instead of having to bounce from site to site or trying to navigate the safer workspaces on Twitter, you can just scroll through Autograph. This isn't a hard sell. This is the truth. I am a UConn fan, and I use the Autograph app to keep up with the writers I read and the pods that I listen to about UConn basketball. The best part is that every piece of content that you consume gives you reward points. The more you get, the more chances you have at things like discounted tickets to games and the grand prize, a trip to the LA Regional and a spot in a suite for the Sweet 16 and Elite Eight games. Here's the best part. We've partnered with Autograph to donate $1 to the V Foundation every time someone downloads the app using the code F68 with a minimum of $2,500 getting donated. The app is free. So download, use the code F68, help us raise a little bit of money for cancer research and give Autograph a try. I promise you it will be worth it. And while we're here, a quick reminder, make sure that you subscribe to The Daily. We have new landing pages with deep dives into each coaching change, as well as a tracker that provides scouting reports on the transfers that have entered the portal that you are going to want to know about. Hit the link below to subscribe. Welcome back to the Friday evening edition of the Field of 68 After Dark. We are sitting here watching the end of the Grand Canyon oh. St. Mary's game with you. St. Mary's just cut it to six with about four minutes and 30 seconds. Not too late, Rob. While we watch the end of this, some of us have Grand Canyon money line right now. <laughs> A little bit more of a sweat than you got right now. But uh, I want to talk about Northwestern and FAU. Game goes to overtime. Uh, Northwestern blows the lead down the stretch. FAU takes the lead. Brooke Barnheiser was awesome. hits a shot to force overtime. Already has an NIL deal with Buffalo Wild Wings, right? Within hours, lands an NIL deal with Buffalo Wild Wings. Uh, we get to OT. Um, we uh, we get Northwestern making a run in OT. They end up winning. They were up by double figures in overtime. My question, though, it's less about Nor Northwestern right now, more about Florida Atlantic. Can we kind of put a bow in the season? Like One thing that I think we, we always tend to do are teams that make runs in March, right? We overvalue what those runs are the next year when we look at it, Jeff. FAU this year never lived up to the hype that they had coming into the season. Should have been about a 10 seed, ended up with an 8 seed. Where do you stand on, on the Owls, on this run, on everyone coming back? Because I'll, I'll be honest, with, between them and Purdue, those are the two things I rooted for more than anything else, the two stories I wanted in college basketball. Reward the guys that come back, reward the guys that show loyalty, and it just, it never felt like it clicked in the gear for him. So Carolina went through it a year ago. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking to Armando Baycott before the season started about the whole deal. Yep. And it was at a different level for Carolina, but what he said was nobody had ever dealt what, with what we had to deal with NIL was. Mm -hmm. And it came so fast, right? Carolina wasn't good. Yep. They were mediocre for 80% of the season. All of a sudden, they went from being very average in their Carolina careers mm -hmm to being heroes were they focused through all that they were traveling all over the place FAU didn't get it at the same level but they got it at a level in Boca at FAU that they had never experienced they said the right things but did they handle it the right way I think there were too many distractions too many people coming at them Dusty May dealing with all the coaching search right now all the jobs open I think that's hard for him to focus on. I just think there's a lot to handle, and that was part of the reason for their inconsistency this year on both ends of the court. They were terrible defensively, and, man, at the end of the game, they were awful to watch offensively. I talked about – I watched them earlier in, in the year, and they don't have that selflessness about them that they had last year. Even at the end of the game, John Tell Davis forced it. He just forced it. Dribbling up also with four seconds left with no sense of urgency. Like, it was just, 
I mean, down there in Florida, there are commercials. They're in like the little commercials. I don't know what. I think it's like Life something, Lock or something. Those kids are on commercials on TV. It came fast, and human nature is to let up when there's prosperity, and that's all they did. They stopped playing defense and forgot the principles and the basics, and they got put out today. I, I was just a little shocked by the management of the game by yeah. both the guys that were on the court and by Dusty May at the end of the game. And Dusty May's made his bones, and he's going to get a job wherever he wants right now. But, like, at, those last two minutes were a bit concerning. And the overtime period was a bit concerning. Uh, just how their players handled that and how it was just bad shot, turnover, turnover, bad shot, and they could never really find something. And then on top of that, Northwestern was on their P's and Q's. They handled everything. Hit shots. Langborg, he, 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 Langborg needs a key to Evanston. I said Chicago earlier. I meant Evanston. Like, those guys, quite frankly, uh, they played great. But I, I, I was a little shocked as a – at watching a team that we thought was so seasoned play so poorly when it mattered most at a time of the year where you'd basically been waiting the entire season to get to. Yeah. And you lay an egg in the last two minutes of the game in overtime? I'm well, not that, really sure what to think about that. That That's what we – that's kind of what we said was going to happen, right? Like FAU was going through the entire season. They're waiting for the moment to get to March, and they get to March, and it's just kind of more of the same. And maybe that's just what they were this year. Maybe that's just what it was supposed to be. But I think that shot at the, I think that shot at the end of regulation where he just casually dribbled up. There was eight seconds. It was almost like a microcosm. Hey, they were of lucky the to be of the in the year. game. Yeah, I mean that flagrant foul. They should have been done. They had no right being in the game at the end. And like yeah. you guys were saying, what the hell is Nelly Davis doing? Go, go get a better shot. Yeah. It was just. It was a microcosm of the entire whole, season. No question. Like no urgency from the players. Right. We're just right. waiting to get somewhere. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, I mean, guys, look, they were twenty-five and nine, and at FAU, that's a great job. Let's not let's not kid ourselves. But a bit of a disappointment. I, I love mean, those kids. Yeah, a bit so, of a like, disappointment. I'm rooting for them, like I think we all were. Yeah, I was. From, I was. From, but you have to be disappointed because you knew what you were capable of if you were FAU. And from my experience, when I was in when we went to the night team my freshman year. We thought we were going to walk out there, Carolina's on our chest and run up and down. Yeah. It just doesn't work like that. And that actually springboarded us to be better next year. So we'll see where FAU goes. But I hope they come back. Yeah. I hope they come back. Listen. They'll be a lot better. Oh, they'll, they'll be a lot better after be dealing better. with this now. Yeah. They're not going to have their head coach yeah. if they come back. <laughs> well, they're not. I mean, Dustin's not coming but, back to FAU. Well, yeah, but they – they can we, go with him. Right. They can go with they him. Go they can go anywhere him. they want. If, if, let's just say. Nelly Davis could get whatever let's he wants. Let's just say, for example, Dusty May takes Louisville or Michigan, right? Do you think that Louisville or Michigan would get better by adding Janelle Davis, by adding Elijah Martin, yeah. Vlad by Golden. adding Vlad Golden? Yeah. I think all of them would. Sure. And uh, I think that's part of the appeal right now right. of going and getting I Dusty hear, May. You're shaking your head. You don't, hey, I think Hanson. Nelly Davis, Nelly Hanson. Davis, the way he played. Well, a nine seed in the American. Are you kidding me? I take Vlad. I take, take Vlad. Nelly. I Come take on. Vlad. There will be no I, Nelly I, Davis slander on the stream. All right. No I'm Nelly Davis slander I, I, on the stream. I'm talking about me. I'm talking about me. <laughs> I'm taking. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm taking. So we're t we, we mean the 2012 Defensive Player of the Year. The I'm just big. I'm just taking. Big guy I'm, that taking can guard? I'm taking Big Vlad, and I'm taking one of the guards. You're out of your mind. One, if you're one, one if you're not taking Nelly, like I'm not saying he doesn't need to get better, but you're taking Nelly Tim. You're out of your mind. I don't know if you're not. He would be the one guard. Yeah. Listen, he would listen, be the one guard you would um, take. Before we move on, uh, our John Fanta was able to catch up with Ryan Langborg, who had 27 points tonight and hit three straight big shots in overtime to give Northwestern the lead and eventually the win. Here's that interview. John Fanta. With Ryan Langborg, he's a March Madness legend these last two seasons. 27 points, that's the Northwestern single game tournament record as the Wildcats beat Florida Atlantic in overtime. Ryan, this was a wild game. You guys find a way to extend it after Brooks Barnheiser comes up clutch. What was the thought process going into OT to then pull it out? Uh, it was our game. I mean, at that point, I mean, you could, if you were in that huddle, you could just see how infectious our energy was. There was no way anyone was, was getting in our way. Um, and I mean, when we play like that, I think we're a pretty tough team to beat. You had 12 points in overtime, four for four from the floor. 
You're knocking down shots left and right. People are chanting in Brooklyn, Ryan Langborg. What was that like? <laughs> I heard it a couple times, but <laughs> it's pretty cool. I can't lie. I mean, this, as you know, playing in March is a dream come true. So, I and mean, playing with all my brothers, this is, it's been tremendous. Chris Collins said you're the perfect fit for this program. What's made Northwestern the perfect fit for you as in, in this grad transfer season? Yeah, I mean, there's two ways to look at it from a basketball perspective, but also from a personality and just humanity perspective. I, mean, I knew on my visit when I was with Brooks that we were going to be boys for life and uh, roommates and everything. So um, from that perspective, everyone's just perfect fit. And then basketball-wise, they run a lot of actions that I like to play in. And defensively, it's challenged me throughout the year. I can't lie. I have games where I was disappointed in my effort, but I know tonight we all brought it. Before last season, Northwestern had one NCAA tournament win all time under Coach Collins. Now wins in back-to-back -back years. Obviously, you were doing things with Princeton last season. But what have you seen coming into this program that makes Northwestern basketball a winning program? I think it's really the effort and intensity that we play with. Uh, I think it's pretty unmatched. And when we when we, when we, get, when we get in those zones, I mean, come on, it's it's just fun. And when we're having that much fun, we're pretty hard to beat because we have so many guys that can go get a bucket, I can guard, and no one's getting beating us on the boards when we're playing that hard. How's a weekend in Brooklyn sound? <laughs> Sounds pretty great. We gotta we gotta focus up, and uh, that game I think is going on soon, so we gotta get prepared. We'll see you Sunday. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you, John Fanta, for getting that interview. It's nice to see somebody was actually working. It'd be great if Jeff Goodman would be able to take a uh, a lesson from John Fanta's work ethic. We got about four minutes here, guys. I want to talk about the Mountain West. I mentioned a little bit earlier. I, I will not tolerate any slander for the Mountain West. They have three and four in this tournament. They got two teams in the second round, despite everybody being underseeded. And Utah State today blows out TCU. I was really you've been talking you've been hyping them up, right? You've been telling me all week that Utah State and San Diego team, State are yeah. the two best teams in that conference. What did you see from them tonight? How impressed were you with what they were able to do? Utah State, man, older guards, Darius Brown, how good is he? And then Ian Johnson's a big time athlete and can score. I, Utah State has guys. Who are they playing in the second round? I don't have my bracket in front of me. Uh, Purdue. Uh, they play. Oh, they play Purdue. It's gonna. It's gonna come down to how great Osibor does against Zach Eady. I know that's a lot, but great Osibor can attack off the bounce too and really get downhill for the top of the key. And Daniel Sprinkle will use him that way. Uh, Utah State's good. That could be the matchup. It could be the matchup. Because bring Eady on the perimeter and make him. There's enough there. there there's enough there. Yeah. I, do I think they beat Purdue? No, I don't. But I, I do think they have enough to make it interesting. Uh, as far as San Diego State, we know what they are. Just a bunch of big physical dudes, rugged, defend, your, defend their butt off, and Jaden Ladee's been terrific all season. Uh, it's a pretty easy one to talk about with, with those two. I mean, Jaden Ladee, really good. 32 points, 11 for 18 from the floor, eight boards, and hit so many big jumpers down the stretch, Jeff. He's yeah, I mean, listen, he makes them from everywhere, and yeah. they got no air on this. I mean, their line drive, every shot he takes is a freaking line drive. And every shot he takes, I feel like goes in. He's a beast. Can I get to Utah State first, though? Yeah. yeah. Because what I think Utah State did today was something that I haven't really seen all year. They've been so reliant on great Al support and Darius Bryant. And Isaac Johnson came to play tonight. Like, big stretch, big. And remember, we talk about Sprinkle, how he inherited nothing last year. Isaac Johnson, he inherited. He was a red shirt. Yeah. He was a red shirt. And Ian Martinez, who's was been well mission, traveled. Is he a mission kid? Big game. Yeah, he's a, he a mission kid. Mission he's kid older too, too, so yeah. he's older. That's the only way they're going to beat Purdue. Like those two have to play well again. Ian Martinez, obviously, you know Darius Brown and Great Austin are going to have to play well. But I, I think Isaac Johnson is a key because again, he's a big you could put in there against Edie and make him have to guard in the perimeter. Yeah, I think so. I, th I think that's a matchup. Purdue can lose. With a big that can make him move around, yes. maybe get him in foul trouble, and then you just swarm him and you hope for the best. That, that, that's what's happened the last two years in yep. their upsets yep. with Fairleigh Dickinson and St. Peter's. They, they, those teams have had bigs that can step out mm -hmm. and make him move, or they're setting down screens and making Edie guard out on the perimeter. Now, Edie's gotten a lot better at that this season, uh, much better, noticeably better. That all being said, uh, Isaac Johnson, he poses some of those problems. You talked about Jaden Ledee. They are flat. He's an odd guy when you watch him in that he gets his rhythm by shooting jump shots. 
he's not one of these guys where he finds his rhythm by backing in, finding easier layups. No. He's much more comfortable shooting over the top and then later attacking the rim. Mm -hmm. He'd much rather get you off balance out there further away from the basket. Yeah. Listen, Grand Canyon is uh, putting the finishing touches on this win over St. Mary's. The score right now is 70 to 60. Tyron Grant Faster is at the line. There's a minute left. When we get back from this break, we're going to talk about Grand Canyon. We're going to talk about how good this team is and whether or not they can beat Alabama next. The best month of the year is here, which is why you need to know that we are now partnered with BetMGM. We'll be using BetMGM lines to make all of our picks, and we'll have special offers for the listeners and the viewers of the Field of 68 all through the NCAA tournament. If you haven't signed up for BetMGM yet, you can use the bonus code FIELD and you will get up to a $1,500 first bet offer on your first wager with BetMGM, regardless of whether or not that bet hits. Here's the best part. All you need to do is deposit and bet $10 of your hard-earned money. This is how you make it work. Download the BetMGM app and sign up using the bonus code FIELD. Deposit at least $10 and place your first wager on any game. And you get up to $1,500 in bonus bets, regardless of the outcome of your bet. Just make sure you use that bonus code FIELD when you sign up. Most importantly, we do have some fun stuff coming for the conference tournaments and especially for the NCAA tournament. Bet insurance tokens, college hoops, odds boost, and what I love the most, a nice parlay boost for anything you could possibly imagine betting on in the NCAA tournament from odds and getting an at large bid to final four futures to the highest seed to make to the sweet 16. I'm calling it right now. Bet MGM is the king of the prop bet for your March madness needs. So go download the bet MGM app, use the code field and sign up today. And while I've got you a quick request, the best way to support the field of 68 and our content you get for free is to engage with us. Rate and review the pod, like and share the YouTube videos, tell your friends about us. It helps in a world where the algorithm is king. And now, back to the show. Well, welcome back to the Friday evening edition of The Field of 68 After Dark. We are live from Mandalay Bay Sportsbook in Las Vegas, Nevada. Jeff Goodman, John Henson, Terrence Oglesby. My name is Rob Doster, and we are watching Grand Canyon and St. Mary's. The game, if you just heard that yell, it's because the total just went over Grand Canyon. It was up by eight with 40 seconds left. Henson, I know this one hurts a little bit. For no, you, no, right? it doesn't hurt. A parlay never, should never hurt. If a parlay hurts, you got to go back to the drawing board. All right, so yeah. let me ask you this then. Grand if King. a parlay hurts, you got to go back to the yeah, drawing board. Parlays are for fun, guys. Just remember that at home. Parlays are for fun. You shouldn't be pissed if you lost a parlay. You need to lower your unit. But keep going. Okay. As soon as, like, that's the best part of this, dude. Like, he, know, he knows the teams. He yeah. knows the game. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? And, and he knows the gambling part of it. Yeah, like, like who, who do you get yeah. other than John Henson? And, Hansen, and we just don't hear from him. All of a sudden, he shows up at Showtime. No right. one has to say anything. The most yeah. reliable yeah. dude on the network. <laughs> hey, tell him, tell him what you showed up with tonight. What I showed up with? Espresso Martini? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, tequila, oh, tequila or vodka in that one? It's still here. Tequila. There you go. All right, let's talk about Grand Canyon. 12 over 5 upset. It is the second 12 over 5 upset that we have today in this tournament. Mm -hmm. Henson, what do you make of Grand Canyon? They get Alabama next. I think Nate Oates needs to be worried about Tyon Grant Foster. The, the, minute, the minute I saw the first – the minute I, I, saw the, I saw the first two minutes of the game, I knew I was in trouble. I knew I was in trouble. I saw Foster Grant flying around. Sliding on defense. I saw them beating St. Mary's shots at the rim. I saw the confidence. I saw the athleticism. I knew I was in trouble. And today, I mean, they're good. They look like a – I mean, if you take off Grand – you take the lopes off that jersey and you just put them out there, they look like a Power 5 team. Southern Cal. Yeah, they look like a Power 5 team. So, um, I think McLaughlin here, I think he had 12 and 11, but – he bullied them down there towards the whole game. Bullied them. The guard play was good. I mean, uh, like I said, the minute I saw the first few minutes, I said, oh. Wait, wait, wait. Henson, are you trying to tell me that there were too many white dudes on St. Mary's? Um, 100%. Um, because <laughs> what happens is they are very athletic. St. Mary's is a good team, but the eight points was just out athleticism, just out. Just, they lost the, the Jefferson kid. They yeah. lost him a few weeks ago. 
and that completely changed. Yeah, it, the did, team. it did. He was kind of the swing guy for yep. them. He was the one who could put them over. The Let top. me tell you, Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon didn't walk out there to tip and thought, "Oh my God, these guys are." Oh my goodness! Tell you that they didn't walk in there like that. So, do they have a chance against Alabama? Hundred percent, hundred percent. I, I don't. Oh, yeah, they do. Yeah, hundred percent. Who? Let me ask you this then: Out of the two 12 seeds that won today, Grand Canyon and James Madison Henson, who who do you think has the best chance to be able to advance? I like Grand Canyon over Alabama in an absolute shootout. I like them both because Grand Canyon is going to. They both win. Yeah, I think they both win. I don't. I think Duke wins. I think Duke wins. So, so hold on. So let me, let me just get this clear in my head. So Grand Canyon or James Madison. James Madison. I, I think that, you, you know, the problem today with Charleston was they weren't athletic enough to keep up with Alabama. Mm-hmm. I, Grand Canyon is. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that's going to be a closer game throughout the duration of the game. Um, they'll have the best player on the floor with Ty and Grant Foster. I think Grand Canyon can win. But JMU, the one, they both could win. Uh, JMU is – Physically, as they were on the defensive end of the floor, they can give Duke problems. They can give Duke problems. Yeah, that's where I stand with it as well. I just I think that that's going to be a really difficult matchup for a Duke team where we've been asking all season long, do they have the toughness to be able to win? But Ty and Grant Foster, give me just tell the story real quick for the people that haven't that don't don't really know what his background is. Yeah, I mean, started in junior college, Kansas, transfers to DePaul. Really can't play Kansas. First game at DePaul, comes out, he hits a three, comes out of the break at halftime, collapses, basically as he's walking in the locker room, and uh, his heart stops. Heart stops, they think he's dead. And uh, they get his heart going again, can't play for two years. Last summer, finally gets cleared by doctors. Goes in the portal the next day, and... He has a connection to one of the assistants at Grand Canyon, ends up at Grand Canyon, and ends up being one of the best players in the country this year mm-hmm. after being off for two full years. Couldn't do anything in those two years. Couldn't Nothing. Sweat. You can't sweat when you have that heart. You can't, you can't sweat or anything. So, yep. impressive. Right. We had three number one teams in action tonight. The three teams that we talked about all season long as a cut above the rest of college basketball. UConn rolls Stenson. Houston rolls Longwood. Most important one, Purdue beat Grambling State. It was a little sweaty there for a second, Henson, but they ended up getting the win. Purdue gonna make Who you, you sweat. They're gonna make you sweat. Purdue's. Gonna, I mean, I think the most impressive was Houston. Um, yeah. Longwood looked like they wanted to go home. I mean, they were like they were just they couldn't score, and the speed at which Longwood was moving the ball was actually pretty good. But Houston's just so connected defensively. They're on a string. Um, if your first time seeing Houston is in the tournament, you're going to have a tough time beating them. And how you beat Houston is starting off Why? Fast. Why? Why? Why do you say that? How you beat Houston? No, why do you say that if you the first time seeing them? Why because the size, the length, athleticism. The bulk. Kev, the bulk. Kevin yeah. Sessions said, hey, look, at halftime, he said, we're not the 87 Celtics. We know where our bread and butter is at, and so do they. So if a team like that, that's scary. No, I – they were absolutely the most impressive. Uh, what they did to poor Longwood, who didn't deserve that, by the way. <laughs> Longwood was so happy to get there. They didn't deserve that. Uh, that was an ass whooping. And here's the thing, too. It, they were up 40 points, and Samson was on them, saying they weren't playing hard yes. enough. Like, and here's the thing. They took care of anything inside the paint. I, I want to say there was five minutes left to go in the game or something like that, and Longwood had six points in the paint. They completely shut down that area of the floor. I I said this last year. I said it two years ago. I'm going to say it again this year. It looks like it hurts to play Houston. Mm -hmm. Every cut is bumped. Every drive is met with extra help and forceful help. Not just help defense, forceful help defense. And they're just different levels of athleticism on that Houston team. It's it's like they kind of play, they kind of run a defensive system like Tony Bennett at UVA where they trap the post and try to get it. Except they have but it's more physical. high level yeah. physical athletes, yes. which is why they graded out as the best team in the country. So. And, they, and they push that pressure out yep. because they have guys that can get out and guard near half court. Mm-hmm. They don't have to sit back there like to, a couple of Tony's guys. Houston just scares me. They play so slow yeah. that that a team that may not be able to be in the game with them physically from a defensive offensive standpoint could, could keep it close. All right, my big question. I'm going to throw it to you, Rob. Which – Number one 
is the most susceptible to losing in the second round now. Okay, so Houston plays Texas A&M. Your UConn Huskies play uh, Northwestern, right? Yep. Uh, Carolina has helped me out here. Carolina has Michigan State. Michigan State, and State Purdue tomorrow. has Utah and State. Purdue has Utah State. Um, I think it's Carolina or Houston, personally. And I, the reason I say that is I think Carolina is a step below those other three teams. And we've said it all season long. There's no disrespect to them. They're just a, it, they're, they're really good. Those other teams are elite this year. Um, and it's Michigan State and Tom Izzo. We've all seen Ta- Tyson Walker go for like 35 before. Right? We know what he is, and we know how good he is as a basketball player. And then with Texas A&M, I mean, when you have Wade Taylor going and Boots Radford going and, uh, and Manny uh, uh, Obaseki, all three of them going, I mean, that, you saw what they did and in Nebraska And tonight. they can rebound with yes. Houston. So I, I think that might be it. I mm-hmm. think that could be the one. And we just saw Houston lose to Iowa State convincingly yes. not long ago. And the, the, Juwan the Roberts at least looked healthy today. The, the difference between Texas A&M and Iowa State is not all that like different in terms of, like, the personnel and the makeup. Now, Iowa State is much better defensively. But Texas A&M can get on that glass. They pound the offensive boards, right? And they got three dudes. They can go get your 30. That's a hard hat game. Yes. That's a hard hat game. Henry Coleman, big yeah. physical. He can yeah. compete physically. Uh and then they have that individual playmaker in Wade Taylor the fourth. I, if I had to pick one that I think is the most susceptible, I think I would go with Houston as well. Because, too, you mentioned their comeback earlier in the season. Uh, they're not having to fight back from 20 now. They, they realize that they can play with Houston. They know Houston they can play with them. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go my my Tar Heels. I put a phone call in today. I told them. I said they they, 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 they over there raw riding in Michigan State. Make sure you tell the boys. But also, I'm a stat guy. I was trying to find a tweet so we could do a little stat check on live, but I, I got the tweet in my phone. Underdogs or teams that have been favored in the 1-8 game by five or less have lost three out of five outright. So statistically, historically, UNC could lose that game if history kind of repeats itself. Mm-hmm. Wow. You got to make your pick. Yeah, I would say... I'd be fearful if I'm Houston. I would be fearful watching Texas A&M today that, again, was it a one-off or could it be a weekend? Could it be a weekend where they're feeling it? They're making shots. They're playing in the same building again. They know they made shots on that court, on those rims. They've got that confidence, that swagger. And, again, they played with them earlier in the season. Yep. Yeah, I will just say one thing. If you want to know why UConn is where they are right now as a program, they were up 33 at halftime. It was the largest lead that they've had since 1986 heading into the half of an NCAA tournament game. And Dan Hurley went to the interview with, I believe it was Tracy Wolfson, pissed off, yelling, and said, we got to grow up a little bit. I The last couple of minutes I didn't like. and went for 30 seconds in that interview ranting about how poorly they played in the last two minutes. They were up 52 to 19 on a team from the Atlantic Sun. Some of the most most fiery speeches I've ever had as a college athlete with Coach Williams when we were up 20, yeah. or when we won by 20. I don't know what it is with those coaches yeah. like. But were you looking at him when he's doing that? They don't that. want you to get settled. Listen, this has been the field of 68 after dark. <laughs> Stick with us on YouTube. We're coming back for the afters here in three seconds. If you like the ACC, you want to stay. And we are clear. Listen. We had we had six super chats come in today. Six people super chats come in. Don't worry about it. You don't know what a super chat is. We had six super chats come in, and they want they want us <laughs> to into the microphone. They want us to apologize about the ACC. And you know what? I think we need to just kind of give. I'm not I'm not going to apologize for anything I said. I will never apologize for anything. They want I said. us to apologize. Yeah, they want us to apologize about the ACC. I'm not apologizing for the ACC. It's still a mid-league. I, I mean, look, it might, it might not be. I mean, league. again, it might like not we be. said it's earlier, it might not be a mid-league. Listen, like Arizona, we, or, uh, Arizona, Virginia's mid, but Clemson beat the brakes. Brakes off New Mexico today. North Carolina is North Carolina. Duke beat up on Vermont, and they covered. Good teams win, great teams cover, Jeff. And NC State. 
NC State has to beat Oakland to get to the Sweet 16. What do they call these again? What are they called? The the the, the super chats. The, money, the super chats. Yeah. Was one of them Kevin Keats? Yes. <laughs> one of them was. It was. How much no. did Keats pay? No. Can we to just get me up? To no, get me to apologize. This. Let's talk about the ACC, man. Like, how impressive has this league been? Clemson. Talk about your Clemson Tigers. Talk uh, about your Clemson uh, Tigers. By the way, they're, the they're good. And I was worried. Somebody's going nuts back here. They're fired yeah, up behind He's fired him. up. He's won more money than I've ever thought of, I'm sure. Uh, no, I, I was worried coming in about this game because, let's be honest, uh, Chase Hunter has had a very up-and-down year. He was one of 11 in their ACC tournament game against Boston College. And he comes out today and goes for 21, uh, doesn't turn the basketball over. And in New Mexico, I, I think today you really saw the difference in size uh, between New Mexico and when you go into it against a team like an ACC Clemson team, who's very big anyway. Uh, Ian Shefflin was awesome attacking the boards. He's the reason that House had two of his fouls because House looks like he was trying to climb a tree, get some of these rebounds. He just he stood no chance. And P.J. Hall and all these guys, there's a lot of talent on that team. And it's a team that goes up against Baylor. I'm not ruling it out, especially if those two guards and Chase Hunter, <laughs> those two guards and Joe Girard and Chase Hunter play well. He, I mean, it's juice. He might have took a pile of two Is he celebrating or no, is he pissed? I think he's pissed. I could he's be celebrating? He does not look happy. I know he was celebrating because he was fist pumping. Or was he? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. We should get him on, maybe. No. Hey, hey look. No. Tell the people again about the parlays, Henson. <laughs> if you pissed off because you lose a parlay, lower your units. <laughs> that's, that's how the casino keeps the lights on. <laughs> <laughs> Trevor says that's for him. <laughs> no, I, Clemson, Chase Hunter, like you said, he's been like this. Yes. Mostly kind of like this. He's Lower. the difference maker. Yeah, no question. He's the difference maker. Because Gerard didn't even play well today. Yep. Didn't even play well, and they still won convincingly. They shut down those guards, though. Shut them down. Yep. Like, how often they made them play slow. all three of them have – have bad games for New Mexico. And they made them play slow. And, and, and another thing, too, when New Mexico tried to push the pace, you know, I worked for Brad for two years. I, I kind of know where, what he was going with. You have to make Jalen House see bodies and see people in front. So, like, every time that he would get ahead of steam, he was seeing at least three guys chest the ball. Build a wall. He's building the wall. He and doesn't finish that well, though. No, he, really he doesn't, doesn't. But but he his trouble finishing anyway. Yeah, but his, his ability to get down there yeah. puts so much pressure on your defense. And there were no avenues for him to get there. And so it put him on his heels. It put Donovan Dent on his heels. And I'm, I'm going to be honest. I, I thought JT Toppa was going to show well today. Didn't have a good day. He really didn't. I, 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 I was mad. Yeah, I know. But, it, but a guy who was freshman of the year, a lot of bounce, a lot of length, a lot of athleticism, he doesn't play low enough to compete with Ian Shefflin, who's every college coach's favorite player that's not on his team. Everybody loves that kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Duke beat Vermont 64-47. to Catamounts. Um, I thought Vermont play, played about as well as you could have asked. Yeah. I thought that they matched up well enough. I thought they executed well. I just didn't think they had the horses this year. I mean, yeah, they, I mean, listen, they hung around, but they don't. The big, I mean, this stat is amazing. I, I don't know if all three of you have seen this yet. Kyle Filipowski took one shot all <laughs> game today. One shot. One shot. Now, again, they won, and they won not as convincingly. They pulled away at the end. It was like a five-point game. But it never, few it was left. one of those ones where it never felt like they were really in trouble. Yeah. UVM had like no. five wide open threes in the start of the second half that all would have started to build momentum, and none of those threes were anywhere near. The, like it just. I, I think Flip taking one shot also shows maturity. It shows that he's here to win, and and I think that's going to bode well because I'm a big law of averages guy. Next game, he's probably going to have a really good game. Yeah. I mean, he, he need they need him in yeah, the next game for sure. Like it's. I, you got a 12 seed and a 13 seed, right? So in theory, you would look at those two teams and say it's it's a comparable kind of a matchup. No, like James Madison's a different level. What are you laughing about? I'm laughing at your buddy Troy. We just hit that. I'll let you read it. If Can you I want tell to. you the best thing about today's game for Duke, though? 
I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Sorry. I can't, I can't even hear them, but let's just stop. Yeah, let's talk. The best thing about today's game was watching that game and seeing Tyrese Proctor dive on the floor. <laughs> yeah. Because what have we said about Proctor all year? Like, too cool. Yeah. Right? Too cool. He literally, loose ball, diving on the floor. Maybe he took a page out of the uh, Carolina book and Coach Shire locked the locker room and put him in the, put him in the visitor locker room. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so I'm sure the message got to them that, hey, people think we're soft. We, we're not. We don't play hard. And, and it looked like. Just some clips, man, of mm-hmm. people calling them soft. It worked for Carolina yeah. a couple of years ago. Right? Listen, yep. we, played Mar- we played Marquette Sweet 16. They said, we go to McDonald's. They're McDonald's All-American. I mean, they just, they they, they, they said everything under the sun. Because we would say, you guys have seen what they said? We said, oh, yeah, we've seen what they said. We were at 40 to 19 at the half. So, got to use that as motivation. Is it fair to call them soft? Like, are we going too harsh when we say that? I think so. I'm I, I think to to college, and I'm too. <laughs> I don't think they're, like, consistently too soft. I don't. Like, Carolina a couple years ago. They were consistently soft, and they looked like they didn't like playing together. I think it's just the blue. The light blue just doesn't bold. You you know, look, yeah, you look soft. You know what I'm saying? You look soft That's in true. light blue. I'm just saying. <laughs> you do. It's deceiving. I mean, it's deceiving. I mean, look at look at Rob. Yeah, you know. Rob, you Rob you look, if Rob had a black shirt on, I'd probably leave him alone in the bar. Right. Light blue shirt, I'd probably, hey, man, what's your name? How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you probably elbow him out of the yeah, way to get to the bar to get your drink. Yeah, I respect right. that. You got anything else to add? Just that we beat your ass in the in the uh, back hallway. Right. <laughs> you look soft. <laughs> you, Henson might be able to. You, hey, you can't beat hey, anybody's ass. Hey, here's the deal. JMU, they better they when they play JMU, they better bring that toughness, uh, and they better have somebody step up in that department. Jeremy mm-hmm. Roach is going to have That's to have true. a big big yes. game. Uh, Filipowski is going to have to take more than one shot. Uh, because that ball's got to move, and you got to be strong with the basketball against JMU, or else they'll turn it into a track meet, and they're going to have a you're going to have a hard time. Yep. Yep. Listen, let's, let's uh, we covered everything. We covered all the ground that we could cover. Not, get, it did get an apology for the ACC from Goodman, but I'm not apologizing. I mean, you they've been you good. Could apologize for what? I'm not apologizing for what? Right. I agree. I've like, been I've been on Duke and Carolina all year. Clemson Agreed. beat the brakes off a New Mexico team that didn't decide not to show up. And NC State found a way to get in the tournament, winning five games in five games. Credit they're gonna to get, them. Hey, they're going to pull a Godfrey, though. Remember a few years ago, Godfrey got to the Sweet 16 by getting good matchups? Yeah. Keats is going to do the same thing this year, right? They get Oakland matchups. tomorrow. I've, I've been on the ACC. I host ACC today twice a week. Oh, you guys I'll be are on, ACC I'll, homers. I'll be, on, I'll be on Wednesday morning, 8 a.m., 371. Um, so... You know, if you guys want to chat, we've got three hours. Yeah. Subtle plug. Yeah. yeah, subtle plug. Listen, we'll be back tomorrow, uh, noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific time. We'll be doing our pregame show. Uh, and, again, tomorrow night after dark, we'll be right here in this exact same spot, somewhere around, like, 12, 15, 12, 30. It all kind of depends on how the games play out. But keep it tuned. Watch, follow us on Twitter. We'll keep you updated there. Before we get out of here for the night, Jeff, toast of the night. Who you got? I'm going to uh, – Brooks Barnizer. Hell yeah. And uh, I ran into him earlier in the year. Did I tell you this story? Yes, you did. Great no, story. Tell everyone. I'm at a bar uh, in Bloomington, Indiana. I'm just at a bar hanging out. I'm not going to say who I'm with at the bar. Uh, but all of a sudden, somebody comes up to me and introduces himself. And he's like, hey, I play for Northwestern. I'm like, oh, cool. Who, you know, I don't know who you are, man. And it's Brooks Barnizer. <laughs> oh, cool. And like, he does not look the part at all. He was visiting some buddies. Class hadn't started yet. He's from uh, Lafayette, West Lafayette. Yeah, yeah. So he was out there in Bloomington visiting some of his buddies who went to Indiana. And uh, what a good dude. Doesn't look the part, but, man, plays hard, plays the right way, and made a huge, huge shot. What was, what was, I, I, was, I was curious because I actually looked on his Instagram today. What was he wearing? What was, what was, what's his swag like? Not as good as your swag. Uh, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just curious. I'm just wondering what he, you know. I, no, I think sometimes right. I see guys on TV, like, I wonder what, how they dress, or I go to their Instagram to I see. I don't remember. I don't really remember. Too many, too many uh, I had a few. Irish car bombs? I had a few. Oh, okay. Um, what was that, was that place called at IU? The Kilroy's. Yeah, Kil- it we almost, it, Kilroy's. It was, it wasn't we Kilroy. Not a Kilroy's. Kilroy almost killed me. Yeah. That's I, all I know. Doster and I went to Kilroy's. Yeah. Um, I won't tell that story. <laughs> 
I um, I'm gonna miss a thirty and twenty, Zach Eady. I mean, it's give the more stat. Can, you're, you're the stack. I give the stat. You know what it is? Yeah, well, I don't. Oh, the, Since 1976, Zach Eady is the second player to ever get thirty and twenty in an NCAA tournament game. Do you know who the last one was? Ralph Sims. It happened in 1995. Shaq. He was an ACC player. Tim Duncan. He was the number one pick. <laughs> you never get a guess. 95. We'll give you 95, the 95, number one pick. We'll give you the Not score. an ACC team Played anymore. Maryland. Played at Maryland. Maryland. Not Lynn Bias. No. No, Lynn Bias was like 84, <laughs> yeah, 82. Joe Smith. Joe Who? Smith. Joe, Joe Smith. Smith. Big Joe Smith. I would have never got that. That was nowhere yeah. in my ballpark. Let's go on. <laughs> But, yeah, Toast is acting. You know. Dude, you know where my Toast is going. Every, it, you could have predicted this one earlier today. It's going to Yale. Who? Going to Yale. Yale. That's where we're going with this Toast. I had so much fun talking shit to Auburn fans for a solid 30 minutes. Responded to everyone. One more shout-out to Auburn fans, Theo. Yeah, one, one, more, one, more, one more. One more. Hey, look. You guys had to take an L for my man. Pulakitis. You took it for Pulakitis. A.K.A. Mr. Fade. Mr. Fade every day. You got a yeah. fade for Pulakitis. That's what happened. My cheer goes to Yale. My, uh, so you stole mine. My toast was going to go to James Jones. For a guy that has taken Yale from a Yale. program that no one pays attention to in the Ivy to a team that's been to four of the last eight NCAA tournaments. Pulakitis. That was the favorite to make the NCAA tournament in 2020 when COVID shut it down. That has now beaten Baylor as a 12 seed in 2016 and, and beaten, um, uh, beat Auburn this year as a 13 seed. This dude gets no credit from anyone. You never hear his name pop up when we're talking about the best men major coaches, the guys that need to get another job, the guys that should take a step up. And you know what, James? Nobody else appreciates you. We at the Field of 68, we appreciate you. We've had him on the show. He's an awesome interview. Think he's taking down his Christmas tree? No, absolutely Still not. Still got it up, right? I bet James Jones is the kind of guy that leaves a Christmas tree up all year long. All year he until the next year? He just unplugs the lights. He just unplugs the lights. But shout out to James Jones. Congratulations. Congratulations to the Yale Bulldogs. And I'm not saying that just to troll Auburn fans. That's my hometown team, New Haven, Connecticut. Stand up. Shout out to my guy, John Pulakaitis. Pulakaitis. I, I asked him his favorite pizza place in New Haven. He said Sally's. Sally's I beats. Sally's. Sally's I beats. He got it right. That's a place where locals go. Tourists go to Pepe's, locals go to Sally's. This has been the Field of 68 After Dark for Jeff Goodman, for John Henson, for Terrence Ogles. Mediocre for pizza. For producer Trevor, who got his first first time ever producer Trevor, was recognized in public. Oh, he was? Yeah. That's Shout true. Out. He did. He was Dude. an Eastern Illinois fan. Came Signed up. an autograph I today, I didn't Trev. get his name. Shout out to you if you're watching. We appreciate you coming up and saying hello. If you guys are in Vegas, in Mandalay, come over and say hello to us. We're friendly. You know who might come over tomorrow? An Auburn fan? Joe Golding. Ooh. Might come by and say hello. I, I've Golding. been told my sources say UTEP head coach Joe Golding is in town. It's probably a bad idea for a basketball coach to be spotted in a sports book during March Madness. <laughs> I'm just going to throw that out there. We can meet him outside. That's why. We can Listen, meet him outside. This is just a place to have a drink and watch the games. I don't know what you guys yeah, are talking yeah. about. <laughs> yeah. he did, the machines are over there. Yeah. He's good. Listen, Field of 68, shout out to Trevor Valise. My name is Rob Doster. We'll see you guys tomorrow morning.